Coaster says North Bali Airport canceled, not rejected. And Prabo emphasizes zero tolerance for corruption at cabinet retreat. Stay tuned for details on these and other stories. Selamat siang. Welcome to the latest news from Bali in Indonesia. This is October 27, 2024, and my name is Bruce. And what is the weather like today? 30.8 degrees Celsius, 70% humidity, and wind speed 9.4 kilometers per hour per second if you want to go back to the old days. Okay, lots of stuff to do today. I've got to go out soon and buy another computer. My computer is, well, after five years, my trusty Acer is having some problems and it's time to upgrade. So let's get right into it. This is Coster's explanation why North Bali Airport in Buleng was canceled, not rejected. Yes, the airport is back in the news again and I can't help but talk about it anytime I see it mentioned. It is just one of those things that has amused me for, I don't know, 20 years or more. So let's see, what does the former governor and possibly new governor have to say about the North Bali Airport? The issue of the North Bali Airport, which was canceled, was explained by the candidate for the governor of Bali Wine Coaster during his campaign in Sarira the other day. A Coaster said the construction of North Bali Airport was not rejected but canceled due to land issues. And who's surprised about that? In Indonesia, there's always land issues. The land that was planned to be used as an airport site in Kubutambahan village had apparently been controlled by a third party. The former governor explained that the plan to build the North Bali Airport had been discussed for a year in 2020 when he served as governor in Bali. It's been discussed <laughs> decades. I discussed it as governor with the Minister of Transportation, Minister of Tourism, Minister of BUMN, Minister of PU, Minister of Land and ATR. It's been discussed at length. They wanted to build it in Kubatambahan village. That was one place. It turns out that the land in Kubatambahan has been controlled by a third party for 90 years. Not only that, the building use rights or certificates and control of the third party are also used as loans by a company. Almost 1.5 trillion rupiah is stuck. The loans are domestic and foreign. We cannot resolve all of them, he said, especially the central government. At that time, it could not be built in Kubatambahan village because of this case. So it was not rejected, but the conditions were not possible in Kubatambahan. And of course, they were going to build it over in the west as well, but well, that didn't work out either. In addition, Coaster also assessed that there needs to be road infrastructure connecting South Bali to North Bali to support airport access, all of which has been discussed for many years. And that was part of the reason that they built the bypass up here or the shortcut going up over the mountains. He said, because if you rely only on shortcuts, it's impossible. <laughs> right, so they figured that out after they made the shortcut. Because the travel time is still more than 1.5 hours. According to the incumbent candidate for governor of Bali, access to the airport is a maximum of 1.5 hours. Actually, a minimum of 1.5 hours. If necessary, just 30 minutes or at most an hour. That's the ideal, he said. This is why the airport cannot be built because the road does not exist. So that people will want to use the airport. If the road is there and the airport's built, okay. Coster then gave an example of Kertajati Airport in West Java. It is said that the airport, which was completed five years ago, has not been able to operate because there's no road access. The airport is idle, the one who is waiting for it to be built. The state has no money, the private sector has invested, the airport cannot operate. It's a loss for them. This may not, must not happen again in Bali, especially in Buleleng, because he's from Buleleng. This is why it's not been able to be built. Coster reiterated that his party has made efforts. One of them is preparing spatial planning regulations. This is so that all of you know it's not easy to build an airport. Therefore, I will try again next time. Hopefully there is a way out. They will definitely agree because the central government already wants it. The regional government just has to support it. 
But before the airport is built, the road must be built so later the airport will function well, he said. And as I discussed in the last video or two videos ago, the new Deputy Minister of Tourism, well, they had this put on her too by local villages up here in Buleleng that she should get this going. And of course, the new Vice President, he made a promise that he was going to get the airport built. And well, I think all of you that watch this channel or have watched this channel for a long time know that the likelihood of that happening is the same as the likelihood of a mermaid showing up in the ocean in front of my house. So the never ending saga of the North Bali airport. I just love it. Okay. And what about corruption? So corruption has always been a problem in Indonesia. Indonesia routinely on the top of the list, they're at the top of the list, up in the top number of countries known for corruption. And well, President Jokowi, when he was elected, the hope was that he would take care of corruption. But according to news reports, as he was getting ready to leave office, corruption has actually gotten worse during his administration. And President Prabowo. What does he have to say? Prabowo emphasizes zero tolerance for corruption at cabinet retreat. President Prabowo Subianto delivered a strong anti-corruption message to his red and white cabinet at the retreat in Magalang on October 24th to the 27th, according to Deputy Manpower Minister Noel Ebenhauser. The president made an analogy saying that a fish begins to rot from the head. Therefore, the leader must set a good example and maintain integrity. Noel said Prabowo made his stance clear by pledging to personally model anti-corruption behavior and indicating that cabinet members who refuse to uphold this standard or pursue personal interests while performing their duty should resign. Prabowo coupled his anti-corruption directive with a call to members of the red and white cabinet to maintain teamwork. Solid teamwork within the cabinet is needed to maintain stable conditions in the country amid the current global geopolitical instability, according to the deputy minister. President Prabowo said that we will face a big crisis later. We must become a solid team. The briefing during the retreat at the military academy in Magalang was also marked by a question and answer session between President Prabowo and members of the cabinet. Ministers, deputy ministers, and special presidential envoys were able to offer suggestions on how to perform their duties more effectively. The retreat is being held in Magalang as part of the briefing of ministers, deputy ministers, and heads of agencies and institutions in the new president's cabinet. The retreat is also expected to strengthen cooperation and coordination among ministries under Prabowo's administration. The cabinet members arrived at the military academy on Thursday. They boarded an Air Force C-130J Super Hercules aircraft from Jakarta, and they landed at the Adusuchipto International Airport in Jogja around 3 o'clock in the afternoon and traveled by road to Magalang. Reportedly, all attendees will be sleeping in tents and wearing military clothing. I love this. Ah, he's putting them through the paces when they've just started. And so I'm going to be optimistic about this. Uh, I've had some questions about, well, the incoming administration, but let's give them a break and see what happens. Let's hope for something good. In the meantime, I just can imagine all the ministers sleeping in tents and wearing military clothing. Wow. Okay, and let's get into some tourism news. Boosting foreign tourist arrivals requires breakthroughs. Tourism actors stated that breakthroughs are needed from the government, stakeholders, and tourism communities to improve and expand the Bali tourism market. One of them is through diversification of tourism products, then supported by strengthening access to supporting infrastructure. Because when talking about market issues, of course, we are talking about the products that will be sold who to sell them to, and how to sell them, according to the head of public relations of the Indonesian Tour Guide Association. That's HPI. According to him, so far the foreign tourist market map has not changed much. The top three foreign tourists to Bali come from Australia, India, and China, followed by other markets, England, America, and the European countries. Then foreign tourists from several ASEAN countries, including Singapore and Malaysia. 
Therefore, in order to invite more tourists to Bali, he said a breakthrough is needed, namely diversification of tourism products that complement Balinese cultural tourism. Agro-tourism and adventure tourism are among the types of tourism products that have the potential to be developed. The variation of tourism products clearly adds to the wealth of tourism attractions. Furthermore, to support the variety of Bali tourism products, the strengthening of access and infrastructure. It's hoped that with the ease of access, the orientation of tourism destinations will also increase, not only directed to busy areas such as the southern part of Bali, but to other areas, namely in the northern or in western or eastern regions of Bali. Infrastructure, infrastructure, infrastructure. According to Paxwarma, foreign tourists from South America and Latin countries are one of the potential markets that are still minimally developed. Therefore, he continued, the issue of accessibility must be readily con considered, such as by adding international flights to Bali. Long way from Brazil, for example. Previously, data from the Bali Tourism Office recorded the number of foreign tourist visits to Bali from January to August as 4,185,000. Of that number, Australian foreign tourists were the most, 1,006,357, followed by Indian foreign tourists, 368,422, and China, 317,883. Outside of Australia, India, and China, tourists from England, South Korea, the United States, France, Malaysia, Singapore, and others. And as I've said many times recently, ad press is getting worse and worse internationally, talking about the big problems here, traffic, pollution of the beaches, overcrowding, and just trash in general. So maybe take care of those first before we start thinking about other tourism product. But I'm not in the tourism business, so what do I know? And more on tourism in Bali, 397,981 tourist visits to tourist villages in Tabanan showed a positive trend. Since January to September 2024, there were 397,981 tourists, predominantly foreign tourists. And they went to a total of 29 tourist villages, as well as 29 tourist villages in Tabanan. However, many of them have not contributed to the number of visits. Only three tourist villages have been visited enthusiastically. Head of Promotion of Tabanan Tourism Office said that the tourist visits to the tourist villages have increased and is predicted that by December it could exceed visits from 2023. In 2023, there were 478,000 visits and he's optimistic that that number will be exceeded. According to him, the number of visits by foreign tourists, 259,045, domestic tourists, 138,936. He said, we recorded the country of origin of foreign tourists who visit the tourist villages so far, but no numbers available. He added that to promote tourism villages in Tabanan, a number of efforts have been made among them, promotions through social media as well as festivals in each village. There are even activities involving tourist village managers and activities outside the region in order to promote tourist destinations in Tabanan, he said. So these tourist villages, have you been to a tourist village that's designated as a tourist village? I'm still a little in the, well, the gray area on these. I'm not sure exactly where the tourist villages are up here. Not that I would go to any of them. I've been to villages all over the island in the past. And, well, my traveling days are limited by some, well, health issues, let's say. Okay, let's talk about food security because that is a huge issue worldwide and Indonesia is very aware of the need for food security here. Deputy Minister of Agriculture, three million hectares of rice fields created for Indonesia's food security. Deputy Minister of Agriculture, Sudayono, stated that the government through the Ministry of Agriculture is intensifying a program to create new rice fields covering three million hectares. This program is to strengthen food security in the face of global challenges and population growth. The program is part of a strategic step in facing the threat of global food crisis and maintaining national stability in the agricultural sector, he said. The deputy minister said that with the projected population growth of Indonesia, which is 
expected to reach 330 million in another 25 years, by 2050, the need for food is also increasing rapidly. According to him, currently the existing agricultural land is increasingly limited due to the conversion of land into industrial and residential areas. Therefore, creating new rice fields is a crucial solution to expand the production area of rice, the nation's main food commodity. The Deputy Minister of Agriculture explained that the program that is a priority for the new president's government is not only due to domestic factors, but also because global dynamics also play an important role in the urgency of this rice field planting. Global economic uncertainty, climate change, and disruption of the international food supply chain due to various geopolitical conflicts like the Russian-Ukraine war are worsening the world's food conditions. According to him, Indonesia, as a country with a large population, cannot depend on food imports. Independence in the agricultural sector is becoming increasingly vital to face this uncertainty. The deputy minister also said that rice field planting program will be integrated with a modern agricultural program that uses, utilizes technology such as the use of superior seeds, modern irrigation, and agricultural mechanization. This is not only about expanding land, but also ensuring that agricultural productivity can increase significantly to meet the needs of the community. Furthermore, rice field planting is also part of the national strategy to reduce dependence on food imports. Although Indonesia has been self-sufficient in rice for the past few years, the threat of a global food crisis reminds us of the importance of increasing domestic production capacity to meet future needs. The current government is also targeting that this rice field planting will certainly create new jobs in the agricultural sector and boost the village economies. Rice field planting is not only an effort to increase food security, but also a way to improve farmer welfare and reduce poverty in rural areas. With this strategic step, Indonesia is expected to be able to maintain national food security while being ready to face changes and uncertainties in increasingly complex global conditions. And that is it for today. Thanks for viewing. Be kind to someone today. Stay safe. And I will see you tomorrow.